Chapter 3 Naimitika Dharma is to be relinquished. One night, just after ten o'clock, Sanyasi Thakur sat chanting Hari Nam on a raised mound in a secluded part of his grove within Shri Godruma. Gazing northward, he saw the full moon had already risen, diffusing an uncommon luster throughout Sri Navadvip Mandala. Suddenly a divine manifestation of nearby Sri Mayapur became visible before his eyes. Sanyasi Thakur exclaimed, Oh, what an extraordinary vision! I am seeing a most astonishing and blissful holy place. Towering jeweled palaces, temples, and ornamented archways are illuminating the bank of the Janavi River by their glittering splendor. The tumultuous sound of Harinam Sankirtan is rising from many places as if to pierce the sky. Hundreds of Vaishnavas like Narada playing upon his veena are chanting Sri Nam and dancing. On one side is fair-complexioned Mahadev with his Damaru drum in his hand. He cries out, O Vishvambar, please bestow your mercy upon me. Saying this, he dances Tandavarnitya wildly, then falls to the ground, unconscious. On another side, the four-headed Brahma sits in an assembly of rishis who are well versed in Vedic law. He recites the following Vedic mantra and lucidly explains its meaning. Mahan Prabhu Vai Purusha Sattva Shaisa Pravartaka Sunir Malam Imam Praptim Ishano Jyotir Avyaya Svetashvatara Upanishad 3.12 That personality is undoubtedly Mahan, Supreme, and he is Prabhu, Master. He bestows the tendency for intelligence, and by his mercy a person can attain supremely pure and transcendental peace. That person known as Mahaprabhu Sri Chaitanya is Purush, the Supreme Person. He is Ishan, the Supreme Ruler. He is Jyotiya Swarup, self-manifest and possessing a lustrous effulgence due to the golden splendor of his limbs. He is Avyaya, the imperishable Lord. Elsewhere, Indra and other devas are leaping in ecstasy, crying, Jai Prabhu Gorachandra, Jai Nityananda. The birds sitting on the branches of the trees are calling out, Gor Nitai. Large black bees are humming everywhere in the flower gardens, intoxicated by drinking Goranam Ras, the liquid essence of the holy name of Gora. Prakriti Devi, the goddess of nature, is maddened with Gora Ras and diffusing her magnificent radiance everywhere. This is wonderful. I have seen Sri Mayapur in broad daylight many times, but I have never beheld anything like this before. What am I seeing? Remembering his Gurudev, Sanyasi Thakur said, O Prabhu, now I can understand that you have bestowed your mercy upon me today by granting me a vision of the transcendental apocrit aspect of Mayapur. From today onwards, I shall call myself a follower of Sri Gorachandra. I see that everyone in this divine land of Navadweep wears a necklace of tulsi beads, tilak on his forehead, and the letters of Sri Nam stamped on his body. I shall also do the same. Saying this, Sanyasi Thakur fell into a state of unconsciousness. He regained external consciousness after a short while and began to cry. Indeed, I am extremely fortunate, for by the mercy of my Guru I have obtained the momentary vision of the sacred land of Sri Navadweep. The next morning, he threw his Ekadanda staff into the river. Then decorating his neck with a three-stranded necklace of tulsi beads and his forehead with the Urdhva Pundra Tilak mark, he chanted Hari Hari and began to dance. When the Vaishnavas of Godruma saw Sanyasi Thakur's extraordinary mood and new appearance, they offered him prostrated obeisances, saying, You are blessed, you are blessed. He became somewhat embarrassed at this and said, Oh, I have accepted this Vaishnava dress to become an object of the Vaishnava's mercy, but now I have met with another obstacle. I have heard the following statement many times from Gurudev's mouth. Trinada pi suni chena tarora pi sahishnuna amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari Sri Shikshastika 3 Considering oneself to be more insignificant than a blade of grass, being more tolerant than a tree, 
and free from all desire for personal prestige and offering all respect to others, one should constantly be absorbed in Hari Kirtan. The very same Vaishnavas whom I consider to be my gurus are now offering obeisances to me. What will become of me? Pondering thus, he approached Paramahamsa Babaji, offered him prostrated obeisances, and stood up with his head bowed. Babaji Mahashai was seated in the Madhavi Arva, chanting Hari Nam. When he saw Sanyasi Thakur's complete change of dress and his awakening of Bhav for Sri Nam, he embraced him and bathed him with tears of love, saying, O Vaishnava Das, today I have become successful by touching your auspicious body. With that statement, Sanyasi Thakur's previous name was forsaken. He received a new life from that day and was now known as Vaishnava Das. Thus he abandoned his Mayavad sannyas dress, his prestigious sannyas name, and the exalted conception he had of himself. That afternoon many Vaishnavas came to Sri Pradumna Kunj from Sri Godrum and Sri Madhyadvip to see Paramahamsa Babaji. They all sat surrounding him, chanting Hari Nam with Tulsi Mala in their hands. They called out, Hagaranga Nityananda, Hasitanath Jai Sachinandana, and their eyes welled with tears. The Vaishnavas discussed among themselves topics related to the confidential service of their Ishtadev, worshipable deity, and then after circumambulating Tulsi Devi, they offered obeisances. At that time, Vaishnava Das also circumambulated Sri Vrinda Devi and rolled in the dust of the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas. Some of the Vaishnavas whispered to one another, Isn't that Sanyasi Thakur? What an extraordinary appearance he has today. Rolling on the ground before the Vaishnavas, Vaishnav Das said, Today my life has become successful, for I have obtained the dust of the Vaishnava's lotus feet. By Gurudev's mercy, I have clearly understood that the jiva has no destination unless he has the dust of the Vaishnava's feet. The dust of the feet of the Vaishnavas, the water that washes their feet, and the nectar emanating from their lips. These three items are the medicine and the way of life for the patient who is afflicted with the disease of material existence. They are the cure for the entire material disease, and they are also the source of transcendental enjoyment for the healthy soul who has become free from this affliction. O Vaishnavas, please do not think that I am trying to show off my scholarship. My heart has now become free from all such egotism. I took birth in a high Brahmana family, studied all the Shastras, and entered the Sanyas Ashram, which is the fourth stage of the social order. As a result, my pride knew no bounds. But when I became attracted to the Vaishnava principles, a seed of humility was sown in my heart. Gradually, through the mercy of all you Vaishnavas, I have been able to cast off the vanity of my noble birth, the pride of my learning, and the arrogance of my social status. Now I know that I am a destitute and insignificant jiva. I was being ruined by my false ego of being a brahmana, by my learning and by my status as a sannyasi. I submit all this before your lotus feet with full simplicity. You may deal with this servant of yours however you deem fit. When the Vaishnavas heard Vaishnav Das's humble words, many of them said, O best of sadhus, we are eager to obtain the dust of the feet of Vaishnavas like you. Please bless us with the dust of your lotus feet. You are the object of Paramahamsa Babaji's mercy. Please purify us by making us your associates. The Shastra says that bhakti is obtained through associating with bhaktas like yourself. Bhaktis tu Bhagavad Bhakta Sangena Parijayate Satsanga Prapyate Pumbi Sukritai Purva Sanchitai Brihan Naradiya Purana 433 Bhakti is awakened when one associates with bhaktas of Sri Bhagavan. Association with Shuddha bhaktas is attained only by the accumulation of transcendental pious activities performed over many lifetimes. We had accumulated a sufficient stock of Sukriti, pious activities that foster bhakti, and that is how we have obtained your association. Now, by the strength of that association, we aspire for Hari Bhakti. When the Vaishnavas had concluded their exchanges of mutual respect and humility, Vaishnav Das sat down on one side of the assembly, thereby enhancing its dignity. The Hari Nam Mala looked brilliant in his hands. 
That day, a fortunate gentleman was sitting with the Vaishnavas. He had taken birth in an aristocratic Brahmana family and was also a Samandir, wealthy landlord. He had studied Arabic and Farsi from childhood and had developed a significant reputation in the country, for he had courted many of the Islamic royalty and was also expert in group dynamics and political strategy. Although he had enjoyed his position and opulence for many years, it had brought him no happiness. At last, he had taken up the practice of Harinam Sankirtan. In his childhood, the gentleman had been trained in Indian classical music by some of the most prestigious music masters of Delhi. Because of that training, he had become strong enough to put himself forward as the lead singer during performances of Harinam Sankirtan. The Vaishnavas did not like his polished classical style of singing. He would show off some of his musical artistry during Sankirtan and then look expectantly at others' faces for recognition. He continued to lead kirtans for many days, and gradually he began to experience some pleasure in Sankirtan. After some time, he came to Sri Godurama in order to join the kirtan programs of the Navadvip Vaishnavas, and he took up residence in the ashram of a Vaishnav there. On this particular day, accompanied by that Vaishnava, he had come to Pradumna Kunja and was sitting in the Malati Madhavi Mandap. When he saw the Vaishnava's humble behavior towards each other and heard Vaishnav Das's words, many doubts arose in his mind. Being a skilled orator, he audaciously raised the following inquiry before the assembly of Vaishnavas. The Manushmriti and other Dharma Shastras state that the Brahmana caste is the highest caste. According to these Shastras, religious rites such as chanting Brahma Gayatri and other Vedic mantras at dawn, noon and sunset, Sandhya Vandana, are considered to be Nitya Karma, eternal duties for the Brahmanas. If these activities are obligatory, why is Vaishnav behavior opposed to them? Vaishnavas have no taste for argument and debate. If the question had been put by an argumentative Brahmana, they would not have replied, for fear of becoming embroiled in a battle of words. However, since they saw that the present questioner regularly sang Hari Nam, they all said, We will be most happy if Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai answers your question. On hearing the order of the Vaishnavas, Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai offered obeisances and said, O great souls, if you so desire, the respected Bhakta, Sri Vaishnav Das, will answer this question in full. All the Vaishnavas consented to this proposal. When Vaishnav Das heard the words of his Gurudev, he considered himself most fortunate and humbly said, I am wretched and insignificant. It is completely inappropriate for me to say anything in such a learned assembly. Nonetheless, I must always bear the order of my Gurudev upon my head. I have drunk the nectar of spiritual instructions flowing from my Guru's lotus mouth. I shall remember that and speak as far as my ability allows. Having smeared his entire body with the dust of the lotus feet of Paramahamsa Babaji, he then stood up and began to speak. Sri Krishna Chaitanya is the source of all different types of expansions and avatars. He is directly Bhagavan himself, full of transcendental bliss. The all-pervading, featureless Nirvishesh Brahma is the effulgence of his limbs, and Paramatma, who resides in the hearts of all jivas, is his partial expansion. May he be pleased to appear in my mind and enable me to answer this question. Manusamita and other Dharma Shastras are respected throughout the world because they establish the codes and prohibitions that follow the line of thought of the Vedic Shruti Shastras. Human nature has two tendencies in regard to religious pursuit. The first is called Vaidhi, to follow the rules and regulations of Shastra, and the second is Raganuga, to follow the soul's spontaneous attraction towards Sri Krishna. As long as the intelligence is under the control of Maya, human nature must be regulated by rules and prohibitions. Thus, in this condition, the Vaidhi nature will certainly be in effect. When the intelligence is liberated from the bondage of Maya, however, human nature no longer needs to be governed by rules and prohibitions. Rather, it is prompted by spontaneous love. In this condition, 
the Vaidhi tendency no longer remains and the Raganuga tendency becomes manifest. This Raganuga tendency is the unadulterated nature of the jiva. It is the perfected state of the self, svabhav siddha, transcendental, chinmaya, and free from bondage to dull matter, jad mukta. The pure spiritual jiva's relationship with the material world is completely terminated when Sri Krishna wills. Until this time, the sadhak jiva's relationship with the material world can only tend toward its eventual cessation, shayan muk. During that time, the jiva's intelligence attains freedom from matter to the extent of swarupata jad mukti, but not to the extent of vastuta jad mukti. At the stage of vastuta jad mukti, the ragatmik of riti, the mood of the ragatmikas, is awakened in the pure jiva, both in terms of his internal identity, swarup, and constitutional state, vastu. This ragatmika prakriti is the nature of the eternal residence of Braj. The sadhak jiva in the shayan muk stage becomes a raganuga by following the service of the Brajabhasis. He then receives many different spiritual graces and progresses very quickly. This condition of raganuga should be ardently sought after by the jivas. Until the jiva comes to this point, his intelligence is always attached to this material world. Because the conditioned jiva is in contact with Maya, his inherent nature changes. In his bewildered condition, he has no pure, natural attachment for spiritual objects, and due to his falsely acquired nature, nisarga, he mistakenly thinks that his attachment for mundane objects is his natural spiritual attachment. The conceptions of I and mine are two types of egoism whose influence is very prominent in the mundane sphere and which lead one to think, I am this body, and all things relating to this body are mine. Due to these conceptions, one naturally feels attracted to people and things that bring pleasure to the material body, and one feels averse to people and things that impede material pleasure. When the bewildered jiva falls under the sway of such attachment and aversion, he considers others to be friends or enemies, and displays love or hatred for them in three ways. In relation to the material body and its acquisitions, in relation to society and social ideas, and in relation to morality and ethics. Thus he engages in the struggle for material existence. The false attachment for kanaka, gold and the things that money can buy, and kamini, anyone who satisfies our lusty desires, brings one under the control of temporary happiness and distress. This is known as samsara, a state in which one wanders throughout the material universe, gaining only birth, death, the fruits of karma, and various conditions of life, some high and some low. The jiva who is bound in this way cannot easily comprehend spiritual attachment, chid anurag, nor can he realize or experience such a thing, in reality, this spiritual attachment is the jiva's true function, svadharma, and his eternal nature. However, he forgets this and becomes engrossed in attachment to matter, although he is actually a particle of consciousness. Thus, he suffers degradation. This is a miserable condition, although hardly any of the jivas who are thus entangled in samsara think so. The jivas bound by maya are wholly unacquainted with the Raganuga nature, to say nothing of the Ragatmika nature. The Raganuga nature may be awakened in the hearts of the jivas, but only occasionally by the mercy of sadhus. Consequently, this Raganuga nature is rare and difficult to obtain, and those who are entangled in samsara are cheated of it by maya. Bhagavan, however, is all-knowing and merciful. He saw that the jivas who are bound by Maya have been cheated of their spiritual inclination. Now, how will they attain good fortune? By what means can remembrance of Krishna be aroused in the hearts of the jivas who are enthralled by Maya? They will only be able to understand that they are servants of Krishna if they associate with sadhus. But there is no specific rule that one must associate with sadhus. So where is the hope that everyone may easily attain sadhusanga? the association of saintly devotees. 
Consequently, there can be no auspiciousness for people in general without the path of rules and regulations, Vidimag. The Shastras were manifested from this merciful consideration of Sri Bhagavan. Issuing forth by his mercy, the sun of the Shastra arose in the sky of the hearts of the ancient Aryan Rishis and illuminated all the injunctions and rules to be followed by the populace. In the beginning was the Veda Shastra. In some places it teaches pious activities directed towards the attainment of material fruits, karma. In other places it teaches knowledge directed towards liberation, gyan. And elsewhere it teaches devotion with love and affection for Bhagavan, priti rupa bhakti. The jivas who are infatuated with maya are found in many different conditions. Some are completely stupefied, some have a little knowledge, and some are knowledgeable in many subjects. The Shastra provides different types of instructions that are consistent with the different mentalities of the jivas. This differentiation is known as adhikar, eligibility. There are countless individual jivas, and they have innumerable varieties of adhikar, which have been divided into three broad categories according to their primary characteristics. Karma adhikar Eligibility for pious action leading to material gain. Gyan Adhika Eligibility for knowledge leading to liberation. And Prem Adhika Eligibility for unalloyed loving service to Bhagavan. The Veda Shastra specifies these three types of eligibility and establishes proper codes of behavior for those in each of the three groups. The Dharma that the Vedas have thus prescribed is known as Vaida Dharma. The tendency by which a person is compelled to adopt this Vaida Dharma is known as Vaidi Pravriti, the proclivity to follow the religious codes of Shastra. Those who are altogether lacking in the tendency to follow the rules of Shastra are thoroughly Avaida, opposed to the injunctions of Shastra. They are engaged in sinful activities and their lives are given over to actions that defy the regulations of Shastra, Avaida Karma. Such people are excluded from the jurisdiction of the Vedas and are known as Malechas, people belonging to an uncivilized, non-Aryan race. The duties of those in the three eligibility groups outlined in the Vedas have been described still more elaborately in the Samhita Shastras of the Rishis, who compose numerous shastras that follow the tenets of the Vedas. The duties of those eligible for karma are described in twenty dharma shastras, compiled by Manu and other pandits. The duties of those who are eligible for gyan are described in the shastras dealing with logic and philosophy, compiled by those who knew the different philosophical systems. And finally, the instructions and activities for people eligible for bhakti have been determined by those who are learned in the Puranas and pure tantras. All these literatures are known as Vedic because they are in keeping with the Veda. Modern day pseudo philosophers of these Shastras, without a view to the underlying purport of all the Shastras, have tried to establish the superiority of only one of its limbs. This has cast innumerable people into a pit of argument and doubt. Bhagavad Gita, which is the matchless deliberation on all these Shastras, clearly establishes that karma not aiming at jnana is atheistic and should be rejected. Karma yoga and jnana yoga that are not directed towards bhakti are also cheating processes. In reality, karma yoga, jnana yoga and bhakti yoga form a single yoga system. This is the Vedic Vaishnava Siddhanta conclusion. The jiva who is bewildered by maya is first compelled to adopt the path of karma. Then he must adopt karma yoga, followed by gyan yoga, and finally bhakti yoga. However, if he is not shown that all these are but different steps on the one staircase, the conditioned jiva cannot ascend to the temple of bhakti. What does it mean to adopt the path of karma? Karma consists of the activities that one performs with the body or mind in the course of maintaining one's life. There are two types of karma, auspicious Shuba and inauspicious, Asuba. The results that the jiva obtains by performing Shuba karma are auspicious, whereas those that he obtains from Ashuba karma are inauspicious. 
Ashuba karma is also known as sin, pap, or prohibited acts, vikarma. The non-performance of shuba karma is known as akama. Both vikarma and akama are bad, whereas shuba karma is good. There are three types of shuba karma: obligatory daily rites, nitya karma, circumstantial duties, naimitika karma and ceremonies performed out of a desire for personal benefit, kamya karma. Kamya karma is completely self-interested and should be rejected. The Shastras direct us to adopt nitya karma and naimitika karma. The Shastras have considered what is fit to be taken up and what is fit to be abandoned, and they have classified nitya karma, naimitika karma and kamya karma as karma whereas akama and kukama, impious activity, have not been included in this category. Although kamya karma is counted as karma, it is undesirable and should be given up. So only nitya karma and naimitika karma are truly accepted as karma. Nitya karma is karma that produces auspiciousness for the body, mind and society, and which results in promotion to other planets after death. Everyone is obligated to perform Nitya Karma, such as chanting the Brahma Gayatri Mantra at the three junctions of the day, Sandhya Vandana, offering prayers, using honest means to maintain one's body and society, behaving truthfully, and caring for one's family members and dependents. Naimitika Karma is karma that one must carry out under certain circumstances or on certain occasions. For example, performing rites for the departed souls of one's mother and father, atoning for sins, and so on. The authors of the Shastras first examine the natures of human beings and their natural eligibility traits, and then established Varnashram Dharma, the duties for the social castes and spiritual orders. Their intention was to prescribe a system in which Nitya Karma and Naimitika Karma could be carried out in an excellent way in this world. The gist of this arrangement is that there are four natural types of human beings, classified according to the work that they are eligible to perform. Brahmanas, teachers and priests, Kshatriyas, administrators and warriors, Vaishyas, agriculturalists and businessmen, and Sudras, artisans and laborers. People are also situated in four orders or stages of life, which are known as ashrams. Brahmachari, unmarried student life. Grihasta, family life, Vanaprasta, retirement from family responsibilities, and Sanyas, the renounced ascetic life. Those who are fond of Akama and Vikama are known as Antyaja, outcast, and are not situated in any ashram. The different Vanas are determined by nature, birth, activities, and characteristics. When Vana is determined only on the basis of birth, the original purpose of Vanashram is lost. Ashram is determined by the various stages of life, depending on whether one is married or unmarried, or has renounced the association of the opposite sex. Married life is known as the Grihasta Ashram, and unmarried life is known as the Brahmachari Ashram. Disassociation from spouse and family is characteristic of Vanaprastha and Sanyas Ashram. Sannyas is the highest of all the ashrams, and the brahmanas are the highest of all the varnas. This conclusion is established in the crest jewel of all the shastras, Srimad Bhagavatam, eleven seventeen, fifteen through twenty one. Varnanam ashramanam cha, janma bhumya nusharina, asan prakritayo nirnam, nichir nicho tamotamaha. The Varnas and Ashrams of humanity have higher and lower natures in accordance with the higher and lower places on Sri Bhagavan's universal body from which they have appeared. Shamo Dhamma Stapa Socham Shanto Sha Shantir Arjavam Mad Bhaktischa Daya Satyam Brahma Prakritayastvima The natural qualities of the Brahmanas are control of the mind, control of the senses, austerity, cleanliness, satisfaction, forbearance, 
simplicity, devotion unto Sri Bhagavan, compassion for the suffering of others, and truthfulness. Tejo Balang Driti Soryam Titik Shaudaryam Udyama Shtayam Brahmanyam Aishvaryam Chatra Prakritayastvima The natural qualities of the Chatriyas are prowess, bodily strength, fortitude, heroism, tolerance, generosity, great perseverance, steadiness, devotion to the Brahmanas, and sovereignty. Ashtikyam dana nishtacha adambo brahma sevanam atustir ata pachaye vaisha prakritayastvima. The natural qualities of the Vaishas are theism, dedication to charity, freedom from pride, service to the Brahmanas, and an insatiable desire to accumulate wealth. Shushrusanam dvijagavam devanan chapyamayaya. Tatra labdena santosha shudra prakritayastvima. The natural qualities of the shudras are sincere service to the devas, brahmanas, and cows, and being satisfied with whatever wealth is obtained by such service. Asocham anritam steyam nashtikyam shuksha vigraha kama krodas chatarascha sabavantya vasayinam. The natural characteristics of those who are in the lowest class and who are estranged from the Vanashram system are uncleanliness, dishonesty, thievery, lack of faith in Vedic Dharma and the existence of a next life, futile quarrel, lust, anger, and greed for material objects. Ahingsa satyam asteyam akama kroda lobhata bhuta priya hiteta cha Dharmo yam sarva varnika. The duties for the members of all the varnas are non violence, truthfulness, abstention from theft, freedom from lust, anger, and greed, and endeavoring for the pleasure and welfare of all living beings. Everyone in this learned assembly knows the meaning of the Sanskrit shlokas, so I am not translating them all. I just want to say that the system of varna and ashram is the basis of Vaida Jivana, life that is carried out in accordance with religious rules and regulations. The prominence of impiety in a country is measured by the extent to which the Vanashram system is absent there. Now let us consider in what sense the words Nitya, eternal, and Naimitika, circumstantial, have been used in relation to the word Karma. If we consider the profound purport of the Shastras, we can see that these two words have not been used to refer to karma in a paramatic sense, which relates to supreme spiritual truth. Rather, they have been used in a routine, vyavaharik, or figurative, upacharic sense. Properly speaking, words like nitya dharma, nitya karma, and nitya tattva can only be used to describe the pure spiritual condition of the jiva. Therefore, in the general use of the word nitya karma, the word nitya is applied to the word karma only in a figurative or attributive sense, because karma in this world is a means to an end and only remotely indicates eternal truth. Actually, karma is never eternal. Karma and jnana may only be thought of as nitya in an indirect sense when karma is directed towards jnana by means of karma yoga and when jnana is directed toward bhakti. The Brahmana's chanting of the Brahma Gayatri Mantra, Sandhya Vandana, is sometimes described as Nitya Karma. This is valid in the sense that practices that are remotely directed toward bhakti through physical activities may be termed Nitya, but only because they aim at Nitya Dharma. In reality, they are not Nitya. This usage is known as a figurative expression, Upachar. Actually, the only true Nitya Karma for the Jivas is Krishna Prem. In ontological terms, this true Nitya Karma is referred to as unalloyed spiritual cultivation, Vishuddha Chit Anushilana, or activities directed towards reinstating one's pure, transcendental consciousness. The physical activities that one will naturally have to adopt to attain this Chit Anushilana 
are assistants to Nitya Karma, so there is no fault in referring to them as Nitya Karma. From the absolute perspective, though, it would be better to refer to such activities as Naimitika rather than Nitya. The divisions of karma into Nitya and Naimitika are only from a relative viewpoint and not from the absolute spiritual perspective. From the point of view of the essential nature of things, the Nitya Dharma of the Jivas is unalloyed spiritual practice and all other types of Dharma are Naimitika. This applies to Varnashram Dharma, duties prescribed for the castes and orders of human civilization, Ashtanga Yoga, the Eightfold Yoga System, Sankhya Gyan, the path of knowledge involving analytical research into the nature of spirit and matter, and Tapasya, asceticism. These are all Naimitika Dharma, because the Jiva would not need these Dharmas if he were not bound. The conditioned state of being bewildered by Maya is itself a circumstantial cause, and the function or duty that is prompted by a circumstantial cause, Nimitta, is known as Naimitika Dharma. Therefore, from the absolute spiritual perspective, they are all Naimitika Dharma. Naimitika Dharma includes the superiority of the Brahmanas, their Sandhya Vandana, and their acceptance of sannyas after renunciation of all karma. All these activities are highly recommended in the Dharma Shastras, and they are beneficial in consideration of appropriate eligibility, but they still have no standing in relation to Nitya Karma. In my estimation, a Bhakta who has taken birth in a family of dog eaters, but who has dedicated his mind, words, activities and wealth to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, is superior to a Brahmana endowed with all twelve Brahminical qualities but who is diverted from the lotus feet of Sri Padmanabha. Such a Bhakta, although of lowly birth, can purify himself and his entire family, whereas the Brahmana who is filled with pride cannot even purify himself. Srimad Bhagavatam 7.9.10 The twelve qualities of Brahmanas are truthfulness, control of the senses, austerity, freedom from malice, modesty, tolerance, freedom from envy, sacrifice, charity, fortitude, studying the Vedas, and accepting vows. Brahmanas endowed with these twelve qualities are certainly worthy of honor in this world. However, if a Chandala is a Bhakta, he is superior to Brahmanas who possess these qualities, but do not have Krishna Bhakti. The purport is that a person who was born a Chandala, but who has been purified by the Samskar, impressions, achieved through Sadhusanga, and who is now engaged in the Jiva's Nitya Dharma of pure spiritual cultivation, is superior to a Brahmana who is established in Naimitika Dharma, but who abstains from the Nitya Dharma of unalloyed spiritual practice. There are two kinds of human beings in this world, those who are spiritually awake, Udita Vivek, and those who are spiritually unconscious, Anudita Vivek. Most people in this world are spiritually unconscious, those who are spiritually awake are rare. Of all those who are spiritually unconscious, the Brahmanas are the best, and the Brahmanas' Nitya Karma, such as Sandhya Vandana, is the best of all the duties that are prescribed for the different Varnas. Another name for those who are spiritually awake is Vaishnava. Their behavior will necessarily be different from the behavior of those who are spiritually unconscious. Even so, the behavior of the Vaishnavas is not opposed to the aim of the Shmriti rules, which are established in order to regulate people who are spiritually unconscious. The ultimate aim of all the Shastras is always one. Those who are spiritually unconscious are bound to a particular portion of the stark and rudimentary injunctions of Shastra, whereas those who are spiritually awake receive the underlying essence of Shastra as an intimate friend. These two groups of people perform different activities, but their aim is the same. Ineligible people may think that the behavior of those who are spiritually awake is opposed to the behavior of people in general. But in reality, the fundamental aim of these different patterns of behavior is the same. From the point of view of those who are spiritually awake, people in general are eligible for instructions regarding Naimitika Dharma. However, Naimitika Dharma is in essence incomplete 
adulterated, impermanent and ultimately fit to be rejected. Naimitika Dharma is not direct spiritual practice. Rather, it consists of temporary material activities that are taken up to attain pure spiritual practices. Hence, it is merely the means to an end. The means is never complete because its function ceases when it has produced the end. Therefore, it is simply a phase in the achievement of the final goal. Consequently, Naimitika Dharma is never complete. For example, a Brahmana chanting the Sandhya Vandana, like his various other duties, is temporary and subject to specific rules. These activities do not stem from his natural spiritual proclivity. If after performing these prescribed duties for a long time, one obtains the association of Shuddha Bhaktas, Sadhu Sangha, one develops Ruchi, taste for Harinam. At that time, Sandhya Vandana is no longer a circumstantial prescribed karma. Harinam is complete spiritual practice, whereas Sandhya Vandana and other such practices are only the means to obtain this principal goal and can never be the complete reality. Naimitika Dharma is commendable because it aims at the truth, but it is eventually meant to be abandoned, and it is mixed with undesirable results. Only spiritual reality is truly beneficial. Although the jiva should relinquish matter and its association, materialism is prominent in Naimitika Dharma. Moreover, Naimitika Dharma produces such an abundance of irrelevant results that the jiva cannot help but get entangled in them. For instance, a brahmana's worship of Ishwara is beneficial, but he is apt to think, I am a brahmana and others are inferior to me. The result of such false egoism is that his worship yields detrimental results. Another example is that an insignificant result of practicing the Eightfold Yoga system is the attainment of mystic powers, which are most inauspicious for the jivas. The two unavoidable companions of Naimitika Dharma are Mukti, liberation, and Bhukti, material enjoyment. But the jiva must save himself from the clutches of Mukti and Bhukti if he is to obtain his real objective, which is the culture of pure spiritual reality, Chid Anushilana. Consequently, Naimitika Dharma entails much that is contemptible for the jivas. Naimitika Dharma is impermanent, for it does not apply at all times or in all conditions. For instance, a Brahmana's priestly duties, a Chatriya's administrative or military duties, and other such circumstantial occupations are brought about by a particular cause, and they cease when the cause ceases. If a Brahmana takes birth as a Chandala in his next life, the Brahminical occupational duties are no longer his Swadharma. I am using the word Swadharma, own duty, in a figurative sense here. The Naimitika Swadharma of the Jiva changes in every birth, but his Nitya Dharma never changes. The Jiva's true Swadharma is Nitya Dharma, whereas Naimitika Dharma is impermanent. One may ask, what is Vaishnava Dharma? The answer is that Vaishnava Dharma is the Jiva's Nitya Dharma. When the Vaishnava, the Jiva, is liberated from matter, he nurtures Krishna Prem in his pure spiritual form. Before that stage, when the Vaishnava is still materially bound, although spiritually awakened, he only accepts objects and association that are favorable for his spiritual practice, and he rejects all that is unfavorable. Thus he never adheres blindly to the rules and prohibitions of the Shastras. He accepts the instructions and prohibitions of the Shastras graciously, but only when they are favorable to his practice of Hari Bhajan. When they are unfavorable, he immediately rejects them. A Vaishnava is the world's only true friend, and he renders auspiciousness for all jivas of the world. Now I have humbly submitted whatever I had to say today in this assembly of Vaishnavas. Kindly excuse my faults and any offenses. Having spoken thus, Vaishnava Das offered satsang pranam to the assembled Vaishnavas and sat off to one side. By this time, the eyes of the Vaishnavas had filled with tears, and they all exclaimed in unison, Well done, well done, blessings upon you. 
The groves of Godruma echoed these words in response. The Brahmana singer, who had asked the question, could see the profound truth of many of the topics presented in the discussion. Some doubts had arisen on certain points, but the seed of faith in Vaishnava Dharma had been significantly nourished in his heart. He folded his hands and said, O great souls, I am not a Vaishnava, but I am becoming a Vaishnava by continuously hearing Hari Nam. If you will kindly instruct me, all my doubts may be dispelled. Sri Prem Das Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai said kindly, From time to time you may associate with Sriman Vaishnav Das. He is a scholar who is learned in all the Shastras. Previously he lived in Varanasi, where he accepted sannyas after studying the Vedanta Shastras deeply. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, who is the dearmost lord of our hearts, displayed unlimited mercy and attracted him here to Sri Navadweep. Now he is fully conversant with all the truths of Vaishnava philosophy, and he has also developed profound love for Harinam. The man who had asked the question was named Sri Kalidas Lahiri. On hearing Babaji Mahashai's words, he accepted Vaishnava Das within his heart as his guru. He thought Vaishnava Das was born in a Brahmana family, and he accepted the Sanyas Ashram, so he is fit to instruct a Brahmana. Besides, I have witnessed his extraordinary scholarship in the Vaishnava truths. I can learn much about Vaishnava Dharma from him. Thinking in this way, Lahiri Mahashai offered Dandavat Pranam at Vaishnava Das's lotus feet and said, O great soul, kindly bestow your mercy upon me. Vaishnava Das offered Dandavat Pranam to him in return and responded, If you bestow your mercy upon me, I will be fully successful. As evening drew near, everyone returned to their respective places. Lahiri Mahashai's house was in a grove in a secluded area of the village. In the center of the Kunja was a natural awning of Madhavi creepers and a raised platform for Tulsi Devi. There were two rooms, one on either side of the Kunja. The courtyard was enclosed with a trellis of chitta plants, and its beauty was enhanced by many trees such as Bail, Neem, and other trees bearing fruits and flowers. The owner of that grove was Madhava Das Babaji. At first Madhava Das Babaji had been a man of spotless virtue, but immoral association with a woman had blemished his Vaishnav character and was curtailing his practice of bhajan. He was quite impoverished and was meeting his expenses with difficulty by begging at various places and by renting out his extra room which Lahiri Mahashai was occupying. That night, Lahiri Mahashai's sleep was broken at midnight. He had begun to contemplate the essential meaning of what Vaishnav Das Babaji had explained when he heard a sound outside. As he came out of his room, he saw Madhava Das Babaji standing in the courtyard and speaking with a woman. The woman disappeared as soon as she saw Lahiri Mahashai while Madhava Das stood motionless and embarrassed before him. Babaji, what is the matter? asked Lahiri Mahashai. It is my ill fate, replied Madhava Das with tears in his eyes. What more can I say? Alas, to think of what I was in the past and what I have now become. Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai had so much faith in me. Now I am ashamed to go before him. Please tell me clearly so that I can understand, Lahiri Mahashai requested. Madhava Das replied, The woman you just saw was my wife when I was a householder. Shortly after I accepted the renounced life of a Babaji, she went to Sri Pat Shantipur, where she built a hut and began to reside on the bank of the Ganga. After many days had passed, I happened to go to Sri Pat Shantipur and saw her there. I asked her, Why did you leave your household? And she explained, Family life no longer appeals to me since I am deprived of the service of your feet. I have taken up residence in this Tirtha, holy place, and I can sustain myself by begging alms. I returned to Godruma without saying another word to her. After some time she also came to Godruma and took up residence in a cowherd's house. I used to see her here and there every day, and the more I tried to avoid her, the closer she drew to me. Now she lives in an ashram that she has built here, and she tries to ruin me by coming here late at night. My bad reputation has spread everywhere, 
and my practice of bhajan has deteriorated solely through my association with her. I am a disgrace to the family of the servants of Sri Krishna Chaitanya. I am the only person since the time of Chota Haridas's chastisement who deserves punishment. Because of their compassion, the Babajis of Sri Godruma have not yet chastised me, but they no longer have any faith in me. When Lahiri Mahashai heard these words, he said, Madhavadas Babaji, please be careful, and return to his room. Babaji went and sat on his seat. Lahiri Mahashai could not sleep. Again and again he thought, Madhavadas Babaji has fallen down by entering householder life again, after he has formally renounced it. It is not appropriate for me to stay here any longer. Even if it does not lead me into bad association, it will certainly spoil my reputation, so that the pure Vaishnavas will no longer instruct me with confidence. Early the next morning, he went to Pradyumna Kunja, greeted Sri Vaishnavdas with due respect, and asked for a place to stay in the Kunja. When Vaishnava Das informed Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai of this news, Babaji gave instructions that he should be given a place to stay in a kutya on one side of the kunja. From then on, Lahiri Mahashai lived in that kutya and arranged to obtain prasad at the house of a brahmana who lived nearby. Thus ends the third chapter of Jaivadharma, entitled Naimitika Dharma is to be relinquished. <laughs>